So Harlan, one of the unique things I've seen just over the past few weeks is we, we always knew that, that public safety as a family was a very large family, right? When we think of everybody we interact with on the, the police, fire, and EMS side and, and in our dispatch centers and communicators, um, and we've always respected, obviously, emergency management and public works and all the different uh, uh, affiliated uh, agencies that respond with us to emergencies each and every day. And we've always known that, that hospitals and emergency rooms and, and, and others are a key part of that, especially when we think of the fire and emergency medical services side that often transport people there. And also on the law enforcement side, we spend a lot of time in and out of hospitals dealing with victims and patients and, and suspects and other things as well. And, and at the same point, I've seen more in the past month or so um, with um, the communication needs of, of permanent hospitals, temporary hospitals, uh, tents and testing centers that are sometimes blocks or miles away from a hospital on purpose to be able to deal with the influx of this pandemic. And, and just the needs are overwhelming. And, and, and the fact that so many individuals at home are, are using data and video so much because they're using you know, different kinds of video platforms for everyday needs. So this has put a major burden on um, the amount of usage of networks and the fact that, that doctors and nurses and so many involved in, in, in um, healthcare are now also leveraging these tools. And we've seen telemedicine just spike through the roof. And we've seen that both on the, the, the community paramedicine, the ET3 or the emergency treatment and transport side of, of EMS agencies. But we've also seen that with, with telemedicine being a viable option to patients going to a hospital or seeing their doctor or having visits. And so, you know, something we always envision, you know, and if you go to the act and go to the, the different definitions we know of public safety, you know, we included those emergency health care workers as part of that. That was a key part of the definition. But, but, but I think we've just seen it explode here because of the circumstances. And I think it's for the better. I think it's for the better that everyone is connected. But just kind of wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, again, you know, it's not all black and white. So the, the issue is, we always envisioned, you know, I was heavily involved in developing the uh, so-called list of eligible users for both primary use and what we call secondary use or, uh, you know, extended primary, whatever. And uh, so the hospitals and uh, nurses, doctors, uh, all those uh, people uh, were always considered to be important. Uh, but uh, what happens is the, the way it's set up is important because uh, in, in a sense, the primary users can change depending on the situation. So for instance, you know, we talk about first responders. First responders to me are pretty much police, fire, and EMS. You can go, you can, you know, everybody says, oh, I'm, a, I'm the dog catcher, I'm a first responder, or I'm the, you know, some of the Ag and Markets inspector. But the fact is, it's police, fire, and EMS. Those are the first responders, they're the key, they're the core. And we added communications because the, the, uh, the dispatchers and the telecommunicators are critical to that three, uh, those three uh, services. So those four, uh, are the primary users that we envision. Everybody else was there as a, what I call extended primary with the understanding that when all of a sudden, uh, the best example we always use was, you know, the utilities. You know, when you have no power and the police and the fire and the EMS people are uh, trying to, to operate and there's no electric power, uh, everything stops. Electric power is king, it's very important. So all of a sudden, who is the primary? The primary more than probably, uh, for the most part, the daily communications of police, fire, and EMS, utilities, until they do their power restoration, everybody else is handicapped, right? So we always use that as an example. Well, now you got this pandemic, it's the same situation. You got all these people working in hospitals every day, they're using landlines and their, you know, their cell phones and other things. But all of a sudden now, they're involved in a major event, which is life and death related. So now all of a sudden, they become primary. You know, uh, and so far, all of these deployments for this pandemic, I mean, I've been following it pretty close. 
there hasn't been anything that has reached the uh, saturation where there's a problem with these people getting priority. They're getting through. It's not creating any problem for other people. Putting the hospitals in a priority mode it hasn't caused a problem for the police, fire, and EMS community. And that's because we have, you know, uh, all this bandwidth, uh, which is dedicated, and we manage it. It's managed for us, not being run by, you know, some other commercial carrier. You know, it's not AT&T's to manage. They're managing it for us. Well, so well you're think, hitting on a point yeah. that I think lots of people just don't even recognize and that, you know, we certainly have band 14 in the 20 megahertz of uh, public safety spectrum, but also as part of that, you know, smart bidders and others, you know, that, that they, they have signed up to sign a, to deploy a lot more spectrum. And we know that, you know, since March 31st of uh, 2017, you know, at and has deployed a lot of commercial spectrum plus first net spectrum. Right. So it's allowing them to have uh, more spectrum for all their customers who are eating a lot more video and data and, and gigabytes of data, you know, per, per, per second in some cases. Um, mm -hmm. and, and going over to the other side on public safety is we're allowing them to have what I, I kind of, you know, quote as a unthrottled experience where, where they can have all the, the the consumption that they need to do their, their roles. And I think that that's, that's critical. And it's just such a different place than where we were a few years ago on, on any network. And then I also think it's going to continue to evolve. If I were to look forward, you know, we're now seeing, you know, Axon embed FirstNet and other public safety networks into their, their body cameras, right? We're seeing right. the use of telemedicine in unprecedented ways and people using hubs and people using different devices. And we have different sensors that are on first responders and, and, and all of these different connections to the network. And so I, I think as this happens, we're going to see this continue to evolve and that there's more and more ways to get good situational awareness, different types of voice communications, different types of data, you know, to and from first responders in the field. And it, 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 as first responders know they can leverage the data and they can leverage the cloud for smart computing and other things because they're always connected, it, it does change the way they operate and gives them more tools. Yep, I agree. Yep. So let me let me uh, let me ask one kind of side sidebar question, but it's 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 very relevant. And I know that over the years, uh, I think all of us have had these conversations with you, uh, Harlan. Um, the now that FirstNet has announced this, you know, cer certainly trialing the availability of mission critical push to talk and the push to talk capability over LTE networks. You know, you come from the LMR world. You live through, you know analog and digital and the the entire maturation process of communications to where we are today. Um, you know, what's your response to the availability of mission critical push to talk and its effectiveness over LTE? You know, what's your response to that first responder that says, I've had my radio for 30 years and I don't leave home without it. And you know, um, this is my tool, you know, wh what are the differences and, and, and how do you come out and talk to folks about, you know, these different tools and, and kind of this, this, you know, banging of heads between LTE and radio, you know, that has happened over, over the years. But, you know, I have my own views, obviously, about the synergies, I think, that these two really play together and as we move forward. But, you know, you, you lived it, you breathed it, I know you have strong views on it. And, uh, sure do. We, I know that we've we've all knocked heads on it to a certain degree, and you know, let let let's have at it. I want to I want to hear what you're thinking now, as we, you know, the the, the first net network has matured, and and now we're getting into that true mission critical push to talk capability. Well, let me go back to 2013 when I was the principal author of a uh, national public safety telecommunications council report titled uh, "Why Can't We Just Use Cell Phones." And uh, and that paper, written in 2013, is just as is uh, applicable today as it was when it was written seven years ago. And in, in that time, I was telling people, and, and uh, uh, I was very skeptical of whether land mobile radio would ever be replaced by broadband uh, type uh, communications. And uh, basically, I was saying. It'll take at least 10 years and maybe never before that ever happens. Today, seven years later, I'm going to tell you the 10 years is still there. 10 years from now, 
as opposed to 10 years, seven years ago. And the fact is that anybody that's talking about mission critical push to talk in broadband doesn't know what they're talking about. There is no such thing as mission critical push to talk at the moment as we have described mission critical, meaning land mobile type reliability. And uh, there were a couple of three things in that paper that are still important. That is number one, that there has to be a reliable uh, unit to unit, peer to peer, whatever you wanna call it, uh, connection so that if you cannot either reach the network or the network isn't operational, you still have a device in your hand that can communicate, okay? And of course, there are limitations to that because our current portable radios and land mobile usually are about five watts of power and we're limited at the highest level in broadband to, you know, one and a half watts of power, I guess one and, one, one and a quarter, I guess. One and a quarter. Yeah, one and a quarter. But the, the fact is that when you do that, now you got to have a bigger battery and you, there's other issues that, that come into that. So the fact is that that hasn't been, that hasn't yet been solved. There are various people that have come up with ways to kind of help solve that, but it's not yet reliable to the extent that we claim to be mission critical. Second thing is that, um, uh, you know, I said, the only way it will become mission critical, acceptable to public safety, is when they have had a chance to test it on a nationwide basis, and it works as good or better than the land mobile push to talk service. And we're, we're not anywhere as close to that. We haven't even come close. You know, there are various, I think push to talk, it's talking about mission critical push to talk is just terrible. I mean, uh, you know, 3GPP came out with standards. They talk about mission critical, which is very helpful. I mean, it's all good. It's a progress. The fact is that just because they say it doesn't make it mission critical. And the fact is that what we have to do is we have to test it and accept it and believe that it does as good or better than land mobile. So right now, uh, the push to talk arena is kind of all over the place. Uh, you have um, you have the FirstNet, uh, you know, uh, enhanced push to talk, which is the standard offering. If you if you're on FirstNet, you can use the EPTT, which is is a Kodiak Motorola product that is being utilized by AT and T and FirstNet. Uh, they have now just recently announced a new offering. Um, unfortunately, in, in my view, uh, that's not necessarily a good advancement, and that is because it's proprietary. I mean, if you don't use an Android device or a Samsung device, it's of no value. I mean, if I'm, I use iPhone, I like it. Uh, a lot of people use iOS. You can't use that push to talk uh, offering uh, unless you're using either a Samsung device or an Android type device. So at the moment, that's not uh, what I call network uh, wide offering. The third uh, option are the what they call the over the top uh, offerings. There are several of them. Uh, I won't mention any of them, but but they work quite well and they work between uh, you can work. You can use those between carriers, use them on FirstNet. You can use them on uh, com other carriers. Uh, and they work quite well. The only uh, drawback is that FirstNet doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't um, FirstNet doesn't um, guarantee those. They don't they don't support them. They don't. Uh, if something goes wrong, you're dealing with that particular uh, vendor who offers that thing. Well, to me, uh, you know, it's pretty good. Now, what I have basically done to just to stop this conversation is to say, look, um, the push to talk we're talking about today, I've coined a new, uh, a new term. It hasn't caught on to anybody yet, but I call it SPTT, support PTT, uh, meaning it's not mission critical, but push to talk 
is a wonderful capability that people should take advantage of. There, I mean, it, to me, uh, it relieves the traffic off the, the uh, mission critical land mobile system. The actual voice quality for the current offerings in broadband are better uh, than what you normally experience in land mobile. The, the, Kodiaks, the, the Kodaks and things like that are better. I mean, I like the sound of it. I can hear it better. Uh, so it's a great service. The, the, you know, the people using it, they should use it every day. Uh, you know, the detectives can use it between themselves. The chief can use it between his staff. All of these kinds of things when you're not on the scene of a major emergency and all of a sudden the network goes down and you need something, uh, you need that mission critical capability. But I want people to know that push to talk today that's being offered is wonderful. People should be taking advantage of it, using it more and more. I just don't like that topic mission critical because I don't, I don't believe it is.